Good afternoon, bon après-midi. Welcome to this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. I'm coming to you live from the brutalist majesty of the Rutherford Physics Building at McGill University in beautiful downtown Montreal, where we continue to comb the depths of knowledge more deeply than Rutherford on a bad hair day. If you are in the Zoom session and you prefer not to be recorded or live streamed, please log out of Zoom and join us via YouTube. Uh, this afternoon, we will have a 45-minute talk, followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. To ask a question in Zoom, please use the raise hand feature following the talk. To ask a question on YouTube, please enter it into the chat. The questions will be relayed to me by my sidekick following the talk. After the Q&A session, the live stream and recording will stop. Professors will be asked to log out of the Zoom session, and undergrads, grads, and postdocs, as well as other non-faculty in the Zoom session, will be invited to the après colloque, a chance to get to know the speaker in a more intimate setting. With that, I will now pass to Professor Jack Senke to introduce the speaker. Jack. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I now feel like I'm on a roller coaster that's just departing. OK, I'm super happy today to have Cindy Regal finally visiting Montreal to talk about some of the optomechanics research she's been doing in, down in Boulder. Um, Cindy, who grew up in Minnesota, incidentally, um, attended graduate school on a Hertz Fellowship um, at UC Boulder in Deborah Jin's group, where she studied ultra-cold Fermi gases. Her thesis won both the DAMOP and Hertz Prizes in 2007 for showing a crossover between BEC and superconductivity in these systems. She then spent some time in Conrad Leonard's group. He visited a few years back, some of you probably remember his talk, developing extremely sensitive mechanical nanobeams capacitively coupled to superconducting circuits. Uh, this is where I was first introduced to her work. Um, she then went on to a postdoc with Jeff Kimball at Caltech, making levitated nanoparticle optomechanical systems before re finally returning to Boulder in 2010 as the university's first Claire Booth uh, Lucci professor to build a research program in optomechanics, uh, some of which you'll be seeing today, um, and cold atoms. On top of this, she was awarded the Packard Fellowship in 2011, the Presidential Early Career Award in 2012, and she became an APS Fellow in 2017. So I've been a fan of Professor Regal and her research since 2008. Uh, and now let me get out of her way so we can see uh, what she and her group have been up to in Boulder. Cindy. Great, thank you. Had to find the uh, unmute button there. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Jack, and thanks a lot for the invitation. As Jack said, uh, we've been hoping I could come to Montreal for, for quite some time, and uh, it's good to at least be able to meet you here in the, uh, in the land of Zoom, as I've, uh, as I've come to call it. All right, so what I'm going to tell you about today is a story about making quantum states of light uh, with moving mirrors. So let me start out with sort of a big graphic um, that shows uh, a physical device that I'll talk a lot about a lot throughout this talk. And what you see here is a silicon frame uh, with a thin membrane that's pulled across it that it looks like a hollow hole uh, if you look in this uh, picture on the screen. Uh, but if you are able to look at this in real life, you'd be able to tilt it back and forth and see that there's a sort of tangible film uh, that's pulled across the silicon frame. It's very thin, about 50 nanometers thick, uh, but it vibrates up and down like a drum or a membrane. And here is shown a higher order mode of that, that vibrational motion of this silicon nitride. And what we do in our experiments, um, generally in this field is we're able to uh, take this silicon nitride membrane that acts like a mass on a spring and we can push on it with radiation forces and uh, correspondingly the mechanical motion can actually affect uh, the light uh, that we're using to push on it as well. And interestingly we can get to a domain uh, where this mechanical object can actually uh, be a quantum harmonic oscillator. We can get it near its ground state of motion. And you know, compared to sort of different microscopic degrees of freedom that you would usually associate with quantum motion, um, this object is the elastic deformation of, of many atoms. Um, but on the other hand, it's fairly simple in the sense that it really just is a harmonic oscillator and it's really a single degree of freedom. It's uh, differentiated a, a bit though in, in spirit though, but it's really a tangible object and our object has a mass of about uh, 10 nanograms or so. 
So I've, I've told you that this object um, can act as a quantum harmonic oscillator, but you uh, might expect that in this sort of thermal environment where this person is holding this chip uh, with their hand, uh, that this object is actually buffeted by the, the thermal connection to its uh, environment. So the Brownian motion might um, preclude uh, seeing sort of this uh, ground state physics. Um, so from this perspective, let me give you a little bit of sort of a backdrop or history um, to the quest to take these type of micromechanical objects to the quantum regime. So circa sort of the early 2000s to around 2010, uh, there was a, a set of people interested in the idea that sort of engineered structures made sort of in this community called MEMS, micro electromechanical systems uh, that were micro uh, machined in a variety of ways um, could actually get to a regime where their temperature was similar to the, to the oscillator energy. And for sort of very high frequency uh, objects that are um, sort of very small, uh, these uh, vibrations might actually be in their ground state if you just um, say put them in a dilution refrigerator. Um, but very simplistically, it might be hard to say measure that motion. On the other hand, you might have an AFM cantilever uh, that you can measure very well. People do this all the time. They feedback damp it in the context of um, AFM. Uh, but the frequency scales are such that you could imagine uh, that you need to use ideas akin to um, laser cooling actually get, to get these objects to their ground state. So fast forward um, some number of years, and we're actually in a regime now where people have taken many different engineered uh, mechanical structures um, and put them in their quantum ground state. These range from um, piezoelectric devices to photonic crystals, um, to drums made of metal that are connected to electrical circuits, um, to membranes like I was just showing you, um, to, to levitated objects. Um, so there's really um, quite a field that surrounds this idea of, of controlling mechanical motion. And you may have um, heard tops about this, uh, about this subject before. And the backdrop of this, you know, there, there's many related um, ideas that we draw on in this field. You know, one is um, trapped ions have been for a very long time a system where people have um, laser cooled them and really studied um, motion of quantum uh, objects. And another backdrop that I'll, I'll talk about a lot throughout this talk is um, quantum measurement of test masses in interferometer experiments such as LIGO. Um, while these test masses um, generally aren't in a regime where the test mass quantization. So we've also gotten into regime now where people are, are not only placing mechanical objects in, in their ground state, um, but really are making genuine quantum states of mechanical motion. And this won't be the subject of this talk so much, but also provides a little bit of backdrop um, for this uh, field, which is that people are now able to, um, by coupling these harmonic oscillator mechanical systems um, to two level systems, people actually count um, individual phonons, phonons with an N, um, mechanical excitations um, using superconducting circuits and are even able to um, place those mechanical objects in quite interesting uh, mechanical, uh, non-classical mechanical states uh, and really characterize those well. So it's a very exciting um, time in the, in the field. And what I hope to tell you about today is I've given you this backdrop of how sort of light and also electricity in an analogous way. Um, with radiation pressure, we can control mechanical motion and, and read it out. And there's many different systems um, that, that people have, have done this with. You know, I'm gonna tell a story today that's a little bit the opposite direction, um, really about how micromechanical motion when we get into this regime um, can really control light and electricity. And hence the title of the talk that's sort of more about um, the quantum states of the light um, that we can create um, with micromechanical motion. And these two regimes um, are, are often intertwined though not exactly the same in terms of when you have quantum states of, of mechanics and, and quantum states of light. Uh, but yeah, let me move along with this idea that we're going to be talking about um, micromechanical motion and how that allows us to create um, interesting quantum states of light or our quest to do so as the time goes on. Okay. So 
as a bit of an outline, uh, what I'd like to start, start talking about first from this perspective of, of thinking about the light that's coupled to this mechanical motion is I want to talk about interferometry and uh, a little bit about quantum measurement history in the context of these type of problems. Uh, and this is a nice place to start because I find that people are always pretty familiar with just a, a basic interferometer. For you sort of connoisseurs of, of different quantum states, um, this part of the discussion will be very much in the land of what we call Gaussian uh, states. Um, so talking about, for example, creating squeeze light um, from the mechanical motion, but it's pretty um, pristine mechanical and optical control. Um, so some good examples of ways that we're able to harness radiation pressure in these systems. Uh, then I'll move on um, to, you know, moving from the sort of history of talking about interferometry um, more to a modern um, quantum information problem uh, that we work on in the context of using uh, micromechanical motion. And in these experiments, uh, we think about this mechanical light interface in the same way as the interferometer here. Um, but we're actually thinking about ways that we can connect superconducting um, quantum bits and their ability to create arbitrary quantum states um, to optical signals through this mechanical motion. Um, so really manipulating electrical and optical signals um, with these uh, mechanical objects. Okay. And uh, throughout, I'll hopefully give you a flavor um, how our moving mirrors, which are like these membranes that I showed on the first slide, are becoming more and more intricate and really a very fun and uh, rich design space um, that actually uh, Jack and, and I have been uh, working on and Jack has helped us understand uh, these, these structures quite a bit. Okay. So uh, as promised, I wanted to start out just by talking about interferometry in a way that's hopefully um, grounding for the rest of the talk. So uh, something to keep in mind as we go along here is the experiments that I'll talk about with these micromechanical membranes and light um, until we get to the part where we talk about you know, potentially introducing a superconducting qubit all of the interactions that I discuss, you really can just think about it as an interferometer and if you like it as a basic picture, this Michelson interferometer. So I, I like to start with the Michelson because it's often in your freshman physics lab. Um, this is maybe the thing that you, uh, that you played around with with your lab partner. And you have a laser beam, um, you slid it between two paths, um, you look at some photocurrent on a photodetector, and you, what you see is the output photocurrent as a function of the differential path length um, between these two objects will, will oscillate like this um, with a fringe pattern. And this is a common measurement tool, like I said, for your, for your lab experiment, as well as heroic tasks um, like, like LIGO, for example. And you can ask, you know, what is the, uh, the basic limit um, to the signal to noise that you expect when you're trying to measure this differential motion? You know, what, is, what is the best that, that you can do? And you know, in, in some typical case, like when you were doing your freshman lab experiment, you know, maybe first you were limited um, by your lab partner knocking on the table um, and you know, creating vibrations that were obscuring the motion of interest. Maybe if you got them to stop, maybe it was a seismic motion or maybe there's um, thermal motion of these mirrors. So there can be many technical sources of noise. Um, but if you ask you know, how much you're just limited by your measurement apparatus, you can ask how well can you sort of split this fringe? What is the noise as you measure right at this point? And that will be limited um, by really shot noise of the measurement light that's being used that goes as square root of n. Um, so it's the Poisson distributed photons of the optical field that are, that are really limiting the measurement. So, you know, one important interferometer um, in very exciting um, recent realizations of observation of gravitational waves, for example, um, that's been around for, for a long time, people thinking about using large test masses to, say, detect gravitational waves. And as people were thinking about making really precision interferometers with, say, these kilogram test masses, but also lots of optical power um, in the arms of such an interferometer, um, you actually get into a limit uh, where it's, it's a little more complex than the, the similar sort of simple case that I was just describing, where your interferometer itself is no longer an immutable structure that just sits there. Um, the light pressure on the mirrors becomes important, and we call this radiation pressure. 
and uh, you know, work by people such as Vladimir Brzezinski in the 1970s found that there should be instabilities in such interferometers um, from mar large amounts um, of optical power and radiation pressure um, that would exist inside of them. And you can also ask a question of, will there be an effect on the signal to noise and your ability um, to measure one of these um, test masses due to this radiation pressure? And the answer is yes, um, the shot noise of radiation pressure uh, will be important um, for such a measurement. And there's actually uh, quite a history of the discussion of this, but you can envision sort of very physically if you have uh, shot noise on the light, um, like you're you know, dumping out a cup of a, a bunch of little lead shot beads, um, these will impinge upon uh, the test masses and there should be some noise associated with the combination of the shot noise of the light and the radiation pressure. You sort of from a, from a different limit, you can ask a little bit about a, a back of the envelope calculation um, that might tell you how well you should be able to, to measure this test mass. So we can consider a thought experiment where we think about um, what we call a free mass limit, um, sort of a time small compared to the oscillation period of the object. And in order to measure this object, you, you have to or measure something interesting. You have to measure the object more than once. So that's sort of the, the premise of this back of the envelope calculation. So you can imagine that if you want to measure this test mass to some uh, delta x at some time t, uh, if, you've, if you've measured it to this level, your momentum will be uncertain to something that's inversely proportional to that delta x measure and related to, to h bar as well. Okay, so at a later time though, your uncertainty in your position will be related to um, this initial position uncertainty, as well as um, something that's inversely proportional to it, right? If I take this momentum and I, and I multiply it by a time to get, to get some distance. If I balance these, I get what is often called the standard quantum limit, where I have to balance imprecision and back action in my measurement. And I find that I have some uh, characteristic scale um, called some displacement at the standard quantum limit that's related to h bar and some characteristic time and some characteristic mass. And so when thinking about gravitational wave detection, um, people put in numbers for these characteristic times and said, no, oh, this might actually be a limit to these types of experiments. And I should warn you though a little bit, and we'll, we'll talk about this a bit as we go along, this is called the standard quantum limit, um, but it's, it's not all that uh, standard. There's multiple standard quantum limits in different uh, types of uh, contexts, um, and it's uh, not always a limit either. So that's a little bit of a uh, heads up there. So, so to give you a little bit of a flavor of the, of the history of this particular problem, um, here's an abstract from, from quite some time ago um, during the sort of um, heart of trying to understand these really precision interferometers. And the abstract is about quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations in an interferometer. Uh, and this is uh, sort of what I'm referring to as radiation pressure shot noise is often what I call it. And it says the interferometer is now being developed to detect gravitational waves work by measuring small changes in the positions of free masses. That's what we were talking about. There's been a controversy whether quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations disturb this measurement. Um, this letter resolves this controversy, they do. Um, so it's a, it's a good way uh, to write an abstract and gives you a little bit of a flavor of how people were um, thinking about these interferometers and this idea of radiation pressure and, and how we think about the quantum noise in such a measurement. And I won't go into a lot of detail, um, but let me give you a flavor of how this is related to, to all the things that I'm talking about today. Um, so this is an interesting quantum measurement problem in the context of an interferometer. And we we're able to actually first experimentally study it in this field of, of micromechanical systems. And this uh, is a way to introduce to you um, this idea that when you're in a regime where your dominant um, uh, force, uh, you know, dominant force noise is due to shot noise. Um, this is a good starting point for thinking about how we create squeeze states of light um, from moving mirrors. And we'll talk about uh, this in that, in that context. So uh, before we get into these ideas of, of how we think about this radiation pressure shot noise, how we might create squeeze states of light um, from such moving mirrors, let me go back and, and start uh, a little less with 
this idea of uh, Michelson interferometer and a little more towards the direction of the actual experimental system that we work with um, in our lab. So I'm gonna explain that, explain a little bit about how we cool such objects and then I'll get um, back into these ideas that, that hopefully we've introduced. So um, our optomechanical system, and Jack used this um, term optomechanical, it's uh, sort of the language that we use to describe the system where we have a mechanical and optical system sort of intertwined. Um, our system in the past number of years has been a, a mechanical element coupled to a Fabry-Perot uh, resonator. And uh, there are many groups throughout the world um, working on, on such systems. And uh, so it's not a Michelson, but it has uh, basically many of the, of the same properties. What we put inside of this uh, cavity, as I alluded to on the first slide, is one of these silicon nitride membranes or drums. Uh, it's very thin, 50 nanometers thick. Um, it's a half a millimeter by a half a millimeter sort of scale, so it's uh, tangible in that way. It has a, a gigapascal of tensile stress. That's what really makes it a drum. And it was for, first in Jack Harris's group at Yale, um, where they realized that uh, really these sort of commercial uh, silicon nitride membranes were a wonderful mechanical system um, really because of this gigapascal of tensile stress um, that really increases the oscillator energy compared to, to other scales. So you can get very large quality factors in these systems, again, by increasing this frequency while keeping your damping fairly constant. You know, people have measured uh, Qs up to 10 to the 8 um, at room temperature now. Uh, and you can have zero point motion if this object is around a femtometer for some context. Uh, we uh, put this um, micromechanical membrane um, inside of a Fabry-Perot cavity, uh, and it's, it sits in there and it changes um, the effective length of the cavity when it moves, so you can really think about it in this sort of simplistic way here. Okay. And to give you a sense of what we're always measuring um, when we think about the system, what we measure is, let's say we just um, put this micromechanical membrane in the cavity, we monitor the output, and we ultimately are interested in the, in the phase of that. And if we look near the mechanical resonance of these structures, which is around a megahertz, um, then we'll find in the displacement spectral density, a peak that corresponds to the Brownian or thermal motion of that mechanical object. And that's what we're characterizing when we think about um, cooling or, or measuring different things about this object. So in our experiments, uh, we've pushed hard to try to make these systems um, pre-cooled via cryogenic systems, in addition to doing um, a laser cooling procedure that I'll talk about uh, in a bit. So we actually um, work with these objects inside of a dilution refrigerator um, that gets down to below 100 millikelvin. Uh, and the object uh, sits, sits right in here inside of this copper box. We're able to um, put light um, inside of this dilution refrigerator actually through a window. And uh, this is a, a close up of the object with a, with a little bit of a window here. And you can imagine, you know, maybe from the very first slide, um, you could wonder a bit about this idea that I'm going to take some very cold micromechanical element and I'm going to shine laser light on it and I'm going to make it cold. You might think the opposite. If I take a laser and I shine it on my finger, my finger is going to get hot. Um, but the materials that we're using are, are really quite nice in the sense that um, in, in the right form, uh, you can actually have very low absorption. And so we can actually have these micromechanical membranes thermalized to scale of 80 millikelvin with the light on in, in such a system, um, which is a nice starting point. So from this starting point, um, we then think about taking this element and laser cooling it. Um, and if you're familiar with the, the field of uh, atomic physics, where you uh, put in light that's red detuned from atomic transition, and you're able to Doppler cool the atoms, um, we're able to do something analogous in the context of our optomechanical systems. Um, so what we do is we take laser light and we red detune it um, from the cavity resonance. And uh, this cavity resonance is some uh, density of states. And this allows us to actually enhance an anti-Stokes process compared to a Stokes process and actually use a, a measurement of their relative rates um, to characterize how cold we are. So if we're near the, the ground state, um, then one of these processes isn't going to happen so much anymore. And we can use this to quantify um, how cold our mechanical object is. 
So these are some data um, for our um, particular membrane in the solution refrigerator that I was showing um, a couple of slides ago. And this is the phonon occupation that we measure um, via comparing these um, Stokes and anti-Stokes processes, what we call a sideband asymmetry, as a function of the optomechanical damping or the amount of light that we're putting into this cavity. And you can see that this um, is doing what I said. We put more and more laser light in there and it doesn't get hotter, it gets colder. Uh, and so we're able to um, sort of what we call cold damp um, this object uh, to below a phonon scale, um, around to 0.2 phonons, so about 80% ground stake occupation. And we measure this by looking at these relative uh, sidebands. And we're able to mesh up uh, with what we expect from just the sideband resolution of our particular system. Uh, and so the extraneous heating in these systems is, is quite small. Okay. And sort of a general requirement for um, taking on this process of, of this cooling to think about it in a somewhat more sophisticated way of, of a competition of rates, which is always what um, happens in, in physics systems. The, you know, for both this cooling procedure as well as when I talk about you know getting into a regime where you can see radiation pressure shot noise or even this transduction process between microwave and optical photons it really comes down to a competition between wanting to make an optical measurement rate or a photon phonon exchange rate with the propagating field large and make the thermalization rate of your mechanical element with its mechanical environment slow. So um, this first one depends on a coupling between your mechanical element and the cavity, um, what we call an optomechanical coupling. Um, the photon number that you're putting in the cavity as well as the cavity damping. And then the rate that we're fighting um, is a thermalization rate um, as related to the mechanical damping, which is inversely proportional to the mechanical Q. Um, so if the energy decays um, very slowly out of the mechanical object, it means the uh, you know, perturbations from the environment are leaking in very slowly. Uh, and this is also related to the initial phonon occupation due to the environment, um, which we suppress by starting out um, cold in these experiments. So this sort of brings us um, back um, to this uh, question about uh, interferometers and how well we can measure uh, motion of these, these types of objects. So let me um, bring back this idea of the standard quantum limit, uh, but now sort of in the terminology of measuring this particular micromechanical membrane and what we might measure in our experiment. So what this um, uh, standard quantum limit means in the context of our micromechanical system is we take actually one of these damped um, micromechanical objects, membranes, and we ask as we increase the measurement strength, trying to ask about the displacement of this object, we measure some spectral density um, that corresponds to the peak of that uh, you know, curve that I was showing you earlier. And in some limit, you would expect that most of your imprecision is due to shot noise, that you aren't um, putting in enough power to, to measure um, well enough, so you have a lot of imprecision in that way. But you can um, beat that down by increasing your measurement strength. Um, but then eventually, this um, back action um, due to the radiation pressure shot noise uh, will become important. And it will turn around when you're on resonance, actually, uh, when the shot noise and back action are actually equivalent um, to the zero point motion or the, the quantum fluctuations of the mechanical element. Um, so you want to uh, figure out if you might be able to see um, this particular uh, regime, say, with a micromechanical system. And you can imagine, even if you had Brownian motion, you could go way out here and see if you could see this back action. Um, but the colder you're able to be, the, the sort of smaller the measurement strength where you can, where you can see these effects. And uh, the interesting effects that you can see, um, not just, for example, you might expect you just sort of see the equivalent of heating um, when you go out here due to this radiation pressure shot noise. But somewhat more interestingly, um, what can happen when you're in this regime where this back action is important is um, the radiation pressure plus the shot noise is really sort of taking the amplitude of the light, the shot noise, driving the mechanical object. And the mechanical object is writing back onto the cavity, um, which is changing the phase of the light. So this is actually a way um, that in uh, a very clean way, you can correlate the amplitude of the light 
to the phase of the light actually through the micromechanical object. So this is sort of our, our first example of how you might imagine this moving mirror um, is actually going to allow you to create a quantum state of light in a regime where, for example, the Brownian motion isn't getting in the way. Uh, and in this way, you can create um, squeezed light, uh, which is a way that you can reduce the fluctuations in one quadrature at the expense of the other. Um, where um, you, you can't go uh, in terms of a product um, below h bar, but in one quadrature, um, you, can, you can make things less noisy. And this has a very sort of historical name. It's called ponder emotive squeezing. It's a mechanically mediated uh, squeezing of light uh, that you can think of as sort of the mechanical system is creating a nonlinear medium. Um, so like in the Kerr, in, Kerr effect, you have an intensity dependent index of refraction. And that's sort of what the mechanical element is doing in the context of, of this optical cavity. So in our experiments, um, we can actually see this effect where the mechanical element is, is manipulating the state of the light. And I'm going to show you a, a set of traces where we look at the, the photocurrent here, where one corresponds to shot noise. And we're doing something to the cavity um, that allows us to mix more and more this amplitude and the phase via the mechanical motion. And as we do this, we see that the um, fluctuations are reduced. Um, below shot noise in some regime. Um, they're increased in other regimes, and this actually follows what you would expect from the theory. Uh, except for this thing right here, that's actually an imposter mechanical mode um, that has, uh, has poked its head up in here. Um, you might be asking as, as we go along, I've shown you sort of all these pretty pictures that show this one particular uh, membrane mode, uh, that this one particular vibration. And you might ask in these systems, how do we possibly only look at that vibration and not the many, many, many other um, eigenmodes of this uh, mechanical system that you might expect to see? Um, and as I talk about mechanical design a little later in the talk, I'll, I'll um, address that uh, question. Uh, but for now, Mo, that we can get um, pretty clean uh, expectations, for example, uh, in this regime of manipulating the light, um, but sometimes other mechanical modes um, do crop up their head. And uh, what we can see in these systems is one of the things is the amount of squeezing of the light that you will get is defined um, by the efficiency of your measurement. It's actually a very honest way to determine how much information are you really getting out of your interferometer. Because when you insert a beam splitter in the context of a, of a measurement like this, you will let noise in um, and you won't be able to, uh, to squeeze beyond that point. Here, we're just getting a little bit of squeezing in this sort of uh, first example, um, but we have gotten sort of scale of 3 dB um, squeezing with these uh, micromechanical systems. Uh, so what can you do uh, with such squeeze light? And there are um, uh, only a finite number of examples of, of what you can do, but this is um, one example uh, of a very uh, brief uh, description of an experiment that we did where we thought about, well, how could we get below this standard quantum limit in broadband uh, detection using um, the squeezing that is created via this ponder motive effect? And if you, for the experts, um, if you set up your homodyne detector and you actually don't look in the phase quadrature, but you rotate it a little bit, um, you can do something called um, variational readout, where you'll find that depending on where you rotate it to and mix these amplitude and phase quadratures, you can actually use this squeezing to improve your measurement um, in some regions of frequencies of space, um, depending upon where you set your detector to. So it's really an example of using the squeeze state of light ultimately to be um, looking at this question of, can you do better than this standard quantum limit? Um, which uh, is, has many nuances in terms of uh, what you do in broadband detection or in resonance and uh, many different measurement problems. And you know, one measurement problem um, that really uh, does care about this, um, you know, this is sort of a model system where we're looking at um, different quantum sensing proposals and, and what can work. Uh, but in actually a very recent paper um, in the LIGO interferometers themselves, um, they have actually seen this ponder motive squeezing effect with these gigantic mirrors. Um, so that uh, is pretty exciting to see. Uh, this is an experiment where um, they actually both inject squeezing uh, in the light and also are able to observe the ponder motive squeezing effects. Okay, well with that, I'm going to sort of transition uh, a bit 
you know, from this first topic where we're just talking about interferometers to a more complex interferometer um, where we're now introducing an electrical component, um, but keeping our original interferometer and asking if this is a way um, that we could connect up light to superconducting qubit systems, um, which is sort of a, a modern quantum information problem um, that we think our membrane mechanical resonators could have an impact on. And as I told you before, I'm still going to tell you uh, about some of these uh, more complex mechanical systems that we're making. All right. So in this part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about this same uh, mechanical optical system. Uh, but now it's a, a bit more complex. We're going to take an LC circuit that is also coupled to that same mechanical system. And we're going to ask whether this is a way that we could actually take a microwave signal and we could upconvert it um, noiselessly and efficiently um, to an optical signal. Could we use this micromechanical element to do this? And maybe if I hadn't given you all of this preview of what I've discussed so far in this talk, you might imagine that this is a really convoluted way um, to solve this problem, right? I mean, I'm going through this particular mechanical element um, that's coupled to its environment, its Brownian motion. This would be a good way to mess up your signal as opposed to um, transduce it. Um, but hopefully I've given you a flavor of the fact that um, these micromechanical systems are really quite controllable. Um, we really can um, couple to them faster with electricity and light than they couple to their environment um, in a way that we think is fairly promising. I've also told you about how this optomechanical system is a very efficient interface or measurement system. Um, we can really preserve squeezing um, that we've created um, via this micromechanical motion. And that efficiency is also important for asking whether this could be a, a good interface. So you know, the problem that we want to solve um, with this particular system, sort of going back a little bit to the motivation, is that in the, in the context of um, quantum networking, for example, where you would want to connect um, different nodes or some long distance here. This is a nice picture of it, uh, uh, a quantum network across the world. You can imagine many different things for the nodes. And increasingly, superconducting quantum bits are a really nice system for manipulating quantum information. Um, but very much the states that you can create are sort of stuck in the bottom of a dilution refrigerator. And in order to go over long distances, you really want to have your state in an optical system, right? Optical frequencies are the natural frequency um, that's really robust against room temperature um, uh, thermal environment. Uh, but interestingly, uh, this link between uh, having a state in a superconducting quantum bit in the microwave domain and um, having that state in the optical domain is really an, an unsolved issue. Um, so it's, a, it's an open problem. And you can imagine this is relevant um, for quantum networking, but maybe also for even asking, are there different ways that um, optical interconnects could even play a role um, in certain architectures, even at the bottom of a dilution refrigerator? So going back to this uh, picture here, where we have our particular, um, in this case now, electromechanical optical system. Um, what are the different um, features of the system that we might want to have if we want it to transduce quantum states, like take a single microwave photon and convert it up to a single optical photon? And what we've been doing in our experiments so far um, is not so much really transducing quantum states. We haven't transduced a quantum state yet, but we've really characterized how close we are to this possibility. And the metrics that we use are, can this transduction process be bidirectional? Is it capable of a unitary transformation um, between these two systems? Um, can it be efficient? Anytime that you have inefficiencies, it's like you've introduced a beam splitter and you're letting uh, noise sort of leak in one port of the beam splitter. Um, and can it have low added noise, like with the Brownian motion of this, um, just to put on extra uh, uh, noise that would obscure the signal of interest. So, you know, one way to uh, also put some of this in context is if you were to think of a way that you might imagine connecting a microwave and an optical signal, uh, the typical way for those of you who work in optics labs that you might imagine doing this is you pull out an electro-optic modulator. And what that is is a nonlinear crystal, something like um, lithium niobate that lives in this nice little package here. It's a uh, very common. And in 
principle, lithium niobate modul modulator could also achieve the metrics that are required for this microwave to optical conversion. Um, but typical devices aren't there yet at all in terms of the efficiencies are, are very, very small. Um, and no one has shown that you could actually um, transduce a state fully in, in that way, though lots of people are working on it. The, you, you can ask from this perspective, you know, why would mechanical motion be something that you might want to use instead of lithium niobate? Um, and it's not clear what will ultimately solve this problem. Um, but for initial uh, work in this direction, the thing that we like about the mechanical motion is I really think of it as sort of engineering a nonlinear material via this um, optomechanical or electromechanical system. Um, instead of pulling a, a crystal out of the drawer um, via the materials uh, and the geometry and the uh, and the size, um, you can create something uh, that is able to um, have this interaction. You know, the squeezing was sort of an example of a way that we were able to engineer some nonlinear material uh, and uh, create squeezed light. And there's sort of a similar story here. Okay, all right, well, let me tell you um, sort of how we make this particular device and where it is right now. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's an open question whether it really solves this problem, but I can tell you what it, what it does do. So this is a collaboration um, with Conrad Leonard's group at Jilla. And so he is a, specializes in superconducting microwave circuits as well as their coupling to uh, mechanical objects. Uh, and uh, he, he does all of the work on creating the part over here. So what we do in these actual experiments is we have a mechanical object that's one of these membranes, uh, but now it's a little more complicated. Um, we have an optical spot that probes the mechanical motion here, um, but then we take a superconducting thin film and we place it over part of the membrane and that uh, superconducting thin film couples to the electrical circuit. And we still have this mechanical membrane mode around one and a half megahertz and the color scale here corresponds to the magnitude of the vibration. Okay, and there's sort of a key aspect of using these tangible millimeter scale um, mechanical resonators, which is in our experiments, we're able to take the optical light and put it over here and keep it fairly far away um, from the superconducting circuit that's over here. Um, because you can imagine that one of the challenges of this particular transduction problem is optical photons have a lot of energy. And if they hit the superconducting thin film, they can create quasi particles and sort of wreak havoc um, upon your, uh, your superconducting circuit. Ooh. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> my uh, iPhone's too connected to my computer. Alrighty. So, what this actual uh, circuit looks like uh, is uh, this. So, we're able to uh, take uh, two different circuits actually, and one that contains the membrane and a superconducting thin film pad, and uh, then another uh, part of the circuit that's actually the bottom circuit that contains a little inductor. And then we uh, flip these two things on top of each other and probe with optical light um, in the spot that you see right there. Um, and these have to be placed very close together so we can make a very small um, capacitor gap separation um, between the, the two plates. And then we take this whole object and we put it into one of these optomechanical cavities. Okay, so the actual assembled device looks like this, looks like a, a very crazy wacky device um, in order to uh, uh, solve this particular problem. Um, but it really comes down to, we have a microwave port, that's this SMA cable, and we have an optical port, which is a, a free space um, hole in the system through which light goes, bounces back and forth between cavity mirrors, um, coupling to this micromechanical object. Uh, a little bit more for the experts in the, in the audience, what we're really doing here is we're pumping both the microwave cavity and the optical cavity. So it's sort of a double parametric process. And uh, it, with that uh, pumping, we then put in a little tone that would be our signal of interest as a sideband on the microwave light. And then it's transduced to a sideband on the optical signal. And we have sort of different rates in the problem, an electromechanical photon phonon exchange rate and an optomechanical photon phonon exchange rate. And so the way that we characterize um, this circuit is actually in, in very sort of electrical engineering language, where we think about the S parameter that describes um, how efficiently we're able to um, transduce information. 
And this S parameter will depend on these rates, these coupling rates, um, as, as well as uh, some overall efficiencies. And in the limit of small mechanical loss, we can actually have this S parameter turn out to be one in the context where we sort of impedance match. We have um, this optomechanical rate and this electromechanical rate are actually equal to each other, which you could imagine um, in these very different physical systems might be hard to get those rates actually to be the same, um, but surprisingly, they, they are very similar. So let me show you some data uh, that actually shows these S parameters in action. Uh, so this is an S parameter where we're looking sort of at reflection off of this conversion box. And when we have the converter off, um, we see a lot of signal reflected. Uh, but when we turn the converter on by putting on these pumps, what we'll see is that we no longer get signal reflected off of the, the circuit, but we find that uh, the signal ends up in the optical port. And it ends up over there with a fair bit of efficiency um, near 50%. And we can actually see this is actual data. It doesn't really look like data, but it's basically a network analyzer trace. So it's very clean. Um, if we do the opposite thing, um, we can actually find that it looks exactly the same. So it really is bi-directional in that way. So the system um, is actually sort of nearly 50% efficient at connecting electrical and optical systems. Uh, the reason it's not quantum yet is the added noise factor is about a factor of 10 away um, from what you would need to connect um, single photons, um, which is quite a bit closer than we were some number of years ago where it was thousands. Um, and we're hoping to um, push on this added noise, combining it with this effect that, that we can make a, a very efficient um, converter. It's much more efficient than, um, than any other um, type of system that you might more naturally imagine could solve this problem. Some of the key noise sources that we're pushing on, um, this is all sorts of gory detail, um, but circuit noise related to which superconductor we're using, worrying about whether the laser light affects the superconductor, lingering thermal noise, these are all things that, that we care about to try to solve this problem. Okay, and a key element that we're um, adding in this system is also thinking about uh, instead of doing uh, homodyne measurements, which is really the measurement um, that I've been talking about throughout this talk, you really want to do photon counting, which means sort of filtering out these pumps. So stay tuned um, for how this really works as a, as a way to take quantum states from the microwave domain and turn them into um, optical signals. So I'm going to end, and I think I maybe have three minutes or so to um, tell you a little bit about these particular mechanical um, devices that we work with and how we really create um, a clean spectrum where we're actually able to probe particular mechanical modes and really isolate them from their environment. Uh, so I've been showing you lots of pictures of these drums here. And pretty much all the time, uh, what we're doing is we're embedding these drums inside of an environment um, that allows us to control the acoustic radiation. So we make a periodic array of masses that creates a band gap in the acoustic spectrum near the megahertz frequencies of interest. This leads to a really clean mode spectrum and also can lead to very high quality factors of this mechanical object. Um, for example, uh, this is a plot where we're driving the membrane and watching the energy decay at these cold temperatures. And with a device like this, and you can see the energy decay over minutes time scale um, for, for this particular object at megahertz frequencies. And there's even um, fancier things um, that we're doing for a variety of frontier experiments um, and are being done around the world. Some of these devices were first made in, uh, in a group in Copenhagen. And in these structures, what we can actually do is we can um, pattern uh, the silicon nitride itself. Um, and Jack's group work, works with a variety of, of these devices where you can, uh, these little holes correspond to black being no silicon nitride and the gold is silicon nitride. And you have a defect mode that in this case looks sort of like a flower. And uh, this periodic array of masses controls the radiation out of the structure via band gap. And also how this material is, is bending actually is able to um, uh, control the effect of material loss uh, via the mode shape. And we can make even more spindly structures um, where now the silicon nitride is much more sparse. Um, it looks much more like the trampolines that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that Jack has made in these very spindly uh, uh, devices.
And here the defect looks something uh, like this. And here the band gap can be very well defined. Um, so we have a bunch of forest of modes out here. And then within this uh, acoustic band gap, we see that we only have uh, one mode that's very isolated from everything else. And we can make uh, more and more complex structures that are more isolated from the environment, lower mass, um, all these sorts of things. This is a, a recent one that we call the snowflake. It has all sorts of different tether attachments here. Uh, this guy actually allows us to sort of move the defect to where we want it to be. Um, so we're having a lot of fun playing with these mechanical structures, um, both for the quantum states of light uh, that I was talking about, um, but also thinking about uh, more force sensing type applications in the context of these, these objects. So to wrap up here, um, hopefully I've told you a bit about frontiers of mechanical systems in the, in the quantum regime. You know, in, in terms of going forward, these mechanical systems are, I think, going to play more and more of a role as a piece in sort of the quantum game, um, you know, potentially connecting qubits in various ways. Uh, there's been an impact on thinking about how you design these mechanical structures and really isolate them have impacted sensing at the macro and mesoscales, sometimes from this um, quantum measurement perspective, and sometimes just from uh, we we're making uh, new interesting devices with different environmental isolation. And going back to some of those sort of the more fundamental uh, motivations, um, we're really pushing boundaries in terms of making optimum mechanical and electromechanical systems with ever larger mass, ever more complex states, um, sort of, uh, pushing uh, on the boundaries of, of what we think of as, as different physical platforms looking at, at quantum states. So with that, um, I think I'm going to wrap up here. And of course, um, many different people involved in the team over the years working on these optomechanical systems, as well as this electro-optic conversion. And uh, Conrad Leonard has been a longtime collaborator on this. And Graham Smith is a, a theorist at Jello who has helped us think about um, quantum transduction. So thanks a lot for your attention and I uh, look forward to answering some questions. Thank you very much for an excellent overview talk with a, a lot of interesting pedagogical content and some really nice uh, pictures of what's going on in the near future. Uh, if you also appreciated the talk and you're in the Zoom session, please write so in the chat. I will be able to share the chat transcript with Professor Regal at the end. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube and you enjoyed the talk, please write something in the chat, uh, let her know. Um, and now we have time for questions, and I think there may be a question that has come in from YouTube already. If you're interested in asking a question in the Zoom session, please use the raise hand feature uh, to move yourself up to the top. Uh, if you're interested in asking a question on YouTube and you haven't already done so, please go ahead and enter a question into the chat on YouTube. So if you're ready, uh, I will ask the first question from YouTube. So the first question from YouTube is, are you also considering a phononic crystal instead of a regular membrane for your electro-optic converter? Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, great, you know, that's a, a good first, uh, very specific and, and very appropriate uh, question. Um, so yes, we currently have a phononic crystal in the converter. It has taken us many years to actually put a phononic crystal in this converter um, because, if I, so to go back to how we make this thing. So you can imagine when we try to flip all this stuff on top of each other and maintain a really small capacitor gap, um, that that's pretty tricky with a phononic crystal. Um, but we now have made this work with a fairly small phononic crystal and uh, with a few, a few unit cells. And we're hoping that this indeed does solve some of our thermal noise problems that we've had in the electro-optic converter. Um, so yes. Great. Uh, so if anyone else has a question in the Zoom session, please go ahead and raise your hand. Or if you prefer, you can type it into the Zoom chat. I think there may be a question from uh, Jack Senke. Jack, if you want to ask a question, please go ahead and unmute yourself. OK. Um, I'm curious uh, if you have, speaking of phononic crystals in these systems, do you have any uh, data on your ability to thermalize it at low temperature with the tethers there's a lot less conductivity or have you done any calculations to see that this is not a psychotic thing to do yeah exactly no it it it, it may be problematic for the silicon nitride crystals so actually the phononic crystal that we put into this device um, is a silicon phononic crystal so there's two different versions that i showed right one with where the 
phononic crystal is made in the silicon itself and then the one made in the silicon nitride. And I actually think the one made in the silicon is more robust against these thermalization questions. And in fact, the variational readout experiment that we did with using the ponder mode of squeezing, that was at 100 millikelvin with the silicon phononic crystal. And we have not actually put a silicon nitride phononic crystal at 100 millikelvin. So I don't know yet what will happen there. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, so Jack, if you're done, please go ahead and remute yourself. Um, so I'll just remind everyone who is not a tenured or tenure track professor in the session that there will be an après colloque uh, that will start immediately following the question and answer session. So you should all stick around to, to talk more to Professor Regal. Uh, and if anyone has a last minute question, please raise your hand in the Zoom session or type it into uh, the YouTube chat. I think I see one that might be coming in <laughs> in the YouTube chat. Maybe I can read it off my other screen here. Um, so maybe we have one time for one last question. So the last question uh, probably is, uh, is the snowflake design motivated by some toy model intuition or uh, it's mostly optimization from many console simulations? That's a good question. Um, so the snowflake is, uh, maybe I'll go to it here so everyone can visualize it. So we, you know, with Jack's help, uh, we actually understand how to think about analytic models for the phononic crystal part. Um, and I think we have pretty good sense of that. But analytic models for thinking about the defect have eluded us to, to some extent, um, because there's a lot to do with how does the stress redistribute when you make certain structures um, combined with various other things that determine, you know, where does this defect end up? So it was based on a little bit of understanding by Chris Reitz, the graduate student who was working on this, but also a lot of playing around in Comsol. So, so I think it is, it is quite a challenge, I think, to analytically understand what's going to happen with these defects, I would say. OK, thanks a lot. Very good. Uh, so if there are no other urgent questions, I think it may be time for us to close the session. Uh, and I don't see any other last minute questions coming in. Uh, so that concludes this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. Thanks to all who have joined us. Please join us again next week for a talk by Nadia Foman uh, from the University of Tennessee entitled The Life and Death of the Free Neutron. Good evening.